And um, one of the things I hope you come away with tonight is we still very much live in uh, an indigenous and native landscape. Uh, and our society is built on top of previous societies. And uh, much of the, what we take for granted in our landscape is a Native American environment, uh, one that was modified and used for thousands of years uh, by many different cultures. So one of the things I, I, I hope you take away from this is um, uh, a long view, a larger view, as we look specifically into the Huron River. And when we look, we're, we're looking specifically at the Huron River, the Huron River, of course, exists in a larger context. So it's necessarily going to telescope in and out a little bit between very focused and larger view. Now, the other thing is I am not an expert on any of the subjects in this talk. I think that many of you here will know much more than I do about certain aspects of this talk. What I've tried to do is to take a big picture and I've spent a lot of time looking at very specific detailed information about this area and how that fits into a larger framework, a larger discussion, uh, a larger history. Uh, so I don't propose, I don't say I'm an expert on this history. I will learn the rest of my life and not be an expert, but I have tried to look very specifically at events, not on this river and then the context of those events on this river. So what you're looking at, uh, and then the, the title of the talk is uh, the Native American Great, let me admit, there we go. Okay, the Native American Great Lakes and the Conquest of Michigan. And I think that says a couple of things. One of the things is, of course, Michigan is a state of the United States. Michigan only exists as a state from 1837 on as part of the United States, really from 1796 on. Uh, Michigan is an artificial entity. It's a political entity. Um, and uh, so what we're talking about is before Michigan, right? And we're talking about the territory of Michigan. Some, sometimes I, I think that we want to claim Michigan has a Native American past. And in many ways, the land has a Native American past, but Michigan is relatively recently. And part of Michigan's Native American past is the denial of Native American rights. Native American legitimacy, Native American uh, uh, <laughs> ability to live on this land. So part of Michigan's uh, history is not is the denial of Native American history. And conversely, um, you know, are Native Americans the first Americans? Well, they might be the first anti-Americans, but I'm pretty sure they're not the first Americans. American is, again, a political definition. Uh, of a colonial settler country, right? And so people are not waiting around to become Americans. They are things well before there is even an imagination of what America is as a country. Uh, the other thing I wanna say before we do a deep dive in is that um, there's a lot of resources out there and those resources are contradictory. And so what we're trying to do in this is to put together contradictory resources. And there's not one story, there is many, many stories. And one of the things that is clear doing the research for this talk is the stories we're missing out on, the stories where there's so little information, in, at least in the, the written records, right? And specifically for the talk we're talking about tonight, Native American women virtually do not exist in, as individuals in records, uh, uh, in historic records written by, by uh, Europeans and, and others. And so to try to uh, place Native American women in this story uh, takes some historical imagination as well as a critical look at uh, our landscape. So for example, the detestable term squaw is used in our landscape a lot of times. There's a squaw, um, a, a, a squaw road just south of Ypsilanti, not far. Now, it's a detestable term, but it also places Native American women in the landscape, places them there, fixes them there. And so one of the things, you know, do we just deny <laughs> that historical record because of the term it uses when we, when we can place a Native American woman 
regardless of the intentions of the of the person who named that thing in the landscape with that. So we're going to take information from everywhere, right? We're going to take information from wherever we can get it and try to coalesce it and make sense of it and be critical about it. And one of those places is a guy named Schoolcraft. And this is a map Schoolcraft has created. And Schoolcraft creates a lot of our imagination about Native American past in Michigan. And most of that is utterly false. Uh, and it begins, you know, it doesn't begin, but it, it, it culminates in the story of Hiawatha, which is an Iroquoian story that he transfers into, et cetera, et cetera. He jumps cultures with it. And, and, and we take the story just to be a sort of a traditional story. And it's really made up by a white guy who thought he knew more about Native Americans than they themselves. And much of our landscape that we think of the names in our landscape, that we think of as native landscape names like Macasta or a lot of names in our landscape are made up by schoolcraft, taking Native American words and putting them together and creating new words that never existed before. So his imagination worked in overtime. And so a lot of what we think of as Native American terms in Michigan are, are things that come out of schoolcraft and have some Native American origins but are part of his imagination. And what you're looking at here is a map uh, he made in the 18, late 1840s. And it, it, what you're looking at is all of the Native American reserves. And one of the things you'll notice by the time that this map is done, most of those reserves are in the Saginaw Valley and north from there. Um, and the other thing I like about this map is that uh, uh, it's a time capsule because these reserves in the Saginaw area would not exist within 10 years of this map. Okay, so let's get started into this deep dive. Okay, so the first picture we're gonna look at is right here. And these women that we're looking at, if anybody could be called descendants of the native people who lived on the Huron River when the Americans arrived. Now, we're gonna get very specific here. Uh, it would be these people. These people are potentially the great grandchildren of the people who were born on the Huron River in the period, let's say, between 1760 and 1815. In that, in that period is when this area of the Huron River was heavily populated by Potawatomi, largely Potawatomi villages, not exclusively, but largely Potawatomi villages. And these women are doing so-called traditional crafts. And if you see this, it says Potawatomi Indians basket weaving, uh, 1909. And so that's 1909, that's ooh, about 110 years ago. And this was taken near Battle Creek. And so that's 90 miles west of Ypsilanti. And the, as some people on the call tonight may be uh, uh, enrolled tribal members in the Nadawisip Huron Band of the Potawatomi. Uh, but this uh, uh, group, which is a federally recognized tribe and has been since, I believe, federally recognized since the mid-90s, uh, but previously state recognized, um, uh, the, the legal right, the legal treaty obligations to pay for the land which Ypsilanti, Ann Arbor, Dexter, this area is now on, still continues with these people, right? So these are the descendants of the people who signed the treaties for this land. Uh, uh, in this area, or the bodies of people that signed for treaties, if not the individuals that signed the treaties for this land. So Ypsilanti, in its own history of itself, does not mention these people. And these people have the name of this river in their name of how they define themselves. They know exactly where they're from. Uh, the Ypsilanti has no idea who was here before, and it's even wrong on the big metal sign in front of the of the historical society. And I did ask once, why was it so difficult to find out that the Potawatomi signed for this land in the treaty when it took me like, you know, like five minutes of looking it up in a history book. And the answer back to me was, and this was years ago, and was, um, I guess we never bothered to ask. So 200 years on this land, believing that you knew all the time who was here before and you were wrong. And that is hubris. And I never bothered to ask is a long-term problem of American society, a long-term problem of American society. So let's think a little bit about terms, names, and places. My name is Matt Siegfried. My wife calls me other names. My friends call me different names. I have a middle name, Charlie. 
I have a role. I'm a historian. I'm an educator. I'm a voter. I'm a worker. Uh, sometimes I uh, uh, am a reader and a writer, right? I have all kinds of different ways to identify myself. And depending on the kind of information I'm trying to convey, I'm going to identify myself differently. I'm a husband. I'm an American. I'm an Ypsilanti. Where am I from? My last name is German. I don't speak any German. I'm not German. I'm an American uh, uh, because this is where I was born. Um, but am I ethnically German because of my last name? Well, I suppose I am ethnically German because of my last name. But how important is that to my identity today? Uh, also, you know, when we talk about where we live, uh, again, we're trying to define where we live by the kind of information we're trying to convey. So do I live in Ypsilanti? Yes. Do I live in the Great Lakes Basin? Yes. Do I live in the United States? Yes. Do I live in the Milky Way? Yes. I live in all of those places, right? So when you ask me, where are you from? Where do you live? I have many different ways I can answer you. So did Native people. So did Native people. They had just as, in fact, a much more rich, varied, culturally vibrant variation of cultures in this area and would have many different ways to answer the question, who are you? Who are you? Where are you from? How do you identify? Right? So please allow Native people to be at least as complicated as we are as people, right? You know, my fa I have a lot of family from down south. I meet them at um, family gatherings, funerals, weddings, uh, family um, uh, uh, homecomings. So I, I have a kind of per very deeply personal and even an obligation relationship to them. But on a day to day level, I don't relate to them at all. I don't even I don't think the same way. I listen to different music. I eat different food. I meet them at funerals and weddings. Right. So are those my? Is that my? core family, or is it the community I live in today? Again, all of these things are, are uh, native cultures have all of these complications. They, of course they do. So let's, let's allow them to be complicated. Uh, again, when, and when we're talking about native people, Indian people, indigenous people, what's in a name? All of these names are complicated. All of these names are contradictory. Indigenous to where and when. The Potawatomi are not indigenous to the Huron River. Even by own stories, Anishinaabe people come from the east, right? Uh, and one of the things we want to do is we want to place people firmly in the landscape because that's how we understand the landscape. Ypsilanti is right where it is. It's always where it is. There are pieces and parcels of property and they have an address and you know that address and you know exactly where that space is. Why do we need that? Because land is a commodity. We exchange it and sell it and it needs to be determined. No such thing existed before for native people, in, in, at least in this area. And one of the things we're talking about is native cultures south of here, west of here, east of here, north of here are different, very different. Uh, and so we're being very specific here. So are people indigenous to here? Are they indigenous to the Americas? Are they all of these things are complicated. I will use all of the terms, Indian, native, indigenous, I will use all of those terms knowing they're all complicated. So what is traditional? The way Potawatomi people lived on the Huron River in 1815 was very different than the way people would have lived on this river in say 1350. Uh, the way Potawatomi people lived in 1750 on this river was different than the way they would have lived in 1815 on this river. So which one of those is traditional Potawatomi life, right? Or is it all part of a traditional Potawatomi life that changes, that has variation, that grows and separates and has new identities because it is as dynamic as any other culture and is related to cultures in a different cultures in a very dynamic way, much more dynamic way than we relate today because there's much more variation in terms of language and how you structure your society. So, for example, I don't know anybody who lives in a matrilineal society. I know nobody, not a single soul. The Wyandotte, just on the Detroit River, would have lived in a matrilineal society. And the Potawatomi up here would have lived in a patrilineal society and yet would have related daily with each other, right? But 
we don't have those kinds of variations in our own communities to have that kind of relate those cross relationships and then what you need to do to understand each other across those different cultures so we we talk in terms of tribe band nation people village self all of these identities are part of uh, the native american life but by the time we get to the period we're going to be mainly talking about which is say 1760 to 1850, this is a village-centered life, right? You, you have created a village. We're, we're looking at a, a, a post-colonial situation where uh, the world has been thrown up and, and remade, reconstituted. There's a lot of continuity and there's a lot of change. Uh, and by the time we're talking about, you may be Potawatomi, you may speak that, but your primary way that you're going to look at yourself is I'm a member of Mogwago's village, I'm a member of Macon's village. Those are, that's the primary way you're going to look at yourself in this terms. And you're going to relate and you're going to make decisions on the basis of your village or your group of villages, right? Okay, uh, this is a system of relationships that exists. We're talking about all that variation in this landscape, cultural variation, linguistic variation, the different ways you live on the land. So you are going to have to create a system of relationships and management cross-cultural and very, very complicated um, uh, imaginative ways are, are created to, to, to address those issues. And we're, we're going to look at what that is. And it's mainly around adoption because Native people in this area don't have a biological notion of race, don't have a biological notion of family. And that's why in some ways it's so ridiculous when uh, people talk about are you Native American by like how much Native American blood you have in you, when that would never be the determinant factor for Native, it would be how culturally Native you are and how much, uh, how responsible you were to your Native American community. And you could have been born white, you could have been born black, you could, you know, that once you're adopted into the community, you're, you become a full member, and especially your children will become full members of that community. So again, there's, there's ways to bridge those divides in the management of a larger cultural sphere in which people are negotiating. So uh, ecology, again, we talked about traditional, and I think it's important to talk we must be specific. You know, when you go, Native people lived like this. Well, Native people on the Huron River, you know, Native people when, where, and who lived like this. You know, uh, Native people in Idaho live very differently than they do in the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, the Mississippian cultures in the Ohio River and Mississippi Valley are much more hierarchical. Uh, there are systems of class and caste that we just don't see in the Great Lakes. It's very egalitarian in the Great Lakes. So these cultures exist within a larger, larger framework. So what do we know and how do we know it? Well, you know, again, we're taking information from all different areas. And of course, there are, the main thing to say is that there are more Native people in Michigan today than there were 200 years ago. So the main way we're going to know about life of, of Native people in Michigan is the Native people who are living here today. That seems obvious to me. I don't know why it's not obvious to so many other people. But again, there are many times more Native people living and more Potawatomi people, more Ojibwa people, more Odawa people, maybe not Wyandotte people, but many more uh, people living in Michigan today than there were 200 years ago, many more Native Americans. So one of the, the main resource are existing Native groups and people. That's the main resource for what we know and how we know it. We also have archaeology and landscape studies, and archaeology is really important. Uh, and archaeology, because of the people and the way that archaeologists originally, as grave robbers basically, not as a science, not as a way to discover, but as a way to collect grave goods and past objects, treasure hunting, all of that, um, and we'll see some examples of that later in Ypsilanti, all of that is not archaeology. Um, all of that is not understanding the past because you're, you already know what you're looking for. I'm looking for that treasure and then you go there and try to find it. Uh, and so you're, you're, you're not even asking questions. You're, you, the question is, where is the item I'm looking for, right? Uh, in more recent times, uh, archaeology has become much better in terms of what it's trying to understand, the questions it's asking, who it's asking those questions about. 
I, I've been lucky to work for the uh, Metro Parks, doing archaeology along the Huron River in the three Metro Parks south of Belleville. And there's not a square inch of that territory uh, in there that hasn't been traced on, lived on at some point in, 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 in the past. Uh, and here, this is my hand holding a, uh, a large shard of pottery that was found in the Oakwood Metro Park. And this piece of pottery, and you can see it's a very old break. So pottery means what? Pottery means people are stay, living in one, you know, you, it's very heavy. It's hard to take around. You, you, you often don't travel with pottery. It's for storing items where you live, right? And often we associate, not exclusively, but we associate pottery with agriculture. And certainly this is an agricultural community that I'm looking at here. This is about uh, a thousand years ago. And um, one of the, I like to give this example because it says how much is out there that we just don't think would be out there. When I was digging this, I was actually digging a 1960s trash pit. And as I, as I widened the trash pit a little bit, I realized that the trash pit was dug into a hearth. And that hearth was a thousand years older than the trash pit. And on that hearth was, a, was this item right here, which had broken literally on the fire where it had been heaten. And just, you know, you can't pick the pieces out of the fire. So they had just left that there. What I was looking at was a moment in time on a fire overlooking the Huron River where somebody was cooking about a thousand years ago and lost their pot. And you can actually, if you look very closely, you can even see kind of fingerprints where people are, are, are putting in there. That was uh, an extraordinary day for me uh, uh, as a historian to, to touch that and see that and have the whole river sort of speak to me for a moment or uh, at least one part of that river speak to me for a moment. So archaeology is important. Landscape is important because people don't live in the landscape willy-nilly or by accident. Where you have a village, where you have uh, hunting territory, where you have agricultural territory, where you have empty space, which is also extremely important in this area, is going to be defined by geography. And so one of the things is looking at the landscape through the eyes of where, how would you uh, as a native person live on this landscape and, and that land will speak to you then. And there's actually the places that become village sites become obvious and there are village sites that you would use over and over and over again, over many, many different layers because a good village site is a good village site. It's a good village site a thousand years from now, if it has a spring and bot, right, all of that. And many of those village sites, especially along the Huron River, Dexter, Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, all of the towns that we know of along the Huron River are former Native American village sites. Why is that? Because the settlers found the best land for a village site, which happened to, I mean, Native Americans knew where the best land for a village site was too, right? So of course they're settling on the best land for village sites, where there's water, where it's, you know, drained, all of these kinds of things. So they're settling largely on Native American areas. The other thing is you need, uh, for white settlers, they needed a mill and a mill required falling water. And a falling water is also where you would uh, cross a river. So the, the river crossing sites, which were of course important in Native American times, become immediately important to settlers because that's where you can have a, uh, a, a mill as well. And Ypsilanti is a prime example of that. And so is Ann Arbor. We also have anthropology and social comparisons. I mean, uh, there are people who live remarkably similar lifestyles to the people we're talking about today still on the planet, right? Like that that world hasn't gone away. Uh, it's much less now. It's a small, you know, where almost all of us lived in tribal societies not too long ago, including everybody in Europe not too long ago lived in a tribal society. Uh, you know, um, that's, that's um, we, we can look at past and we can look at other tribal societies and think about how they exist in the landscape. If you look at uh, a lot of Native American mounds and hilltop enclosures in the Midwest, if you went to Britain, you would see very similar things in the landscape from a very similar time of period, right? Because people look at the landscape and have needs that are similar, that are similar. We also have primary sources. 
So we have the Jesuits, the government, the military, all of those things. And of course, you read those with an incredible grain of salt, uh, but they are full of information. The Jesuits, when they were first, you know, they, they, to be, they have to, they're Catholic, so they want to be able to speak in the language of the people they're trying to convert. So they learn all the languages, right? The French Jesuits and write them down in detail. The uh, English, they don't care about that so much. They're, they're not worried about saving souls. So they don't write that stuff down. You're going to learn English, right? So you, you can take uh, information from these places. And even when it's through the distorted lens of a Jesuit who is seen as a native person, they're seeing souls to save, right? That's that's the, the, the goggles they have on. But you can take all kinds of information from that. In Michigan specifically, we have the 1843 Indian Affairs documents, and we'll learn a lot about um, um, the Potawatomi of the Huron River from those, because that's within the lifetime that people were living here. And so you have first person accounts of being born on this river. Uh, and then you have later Bureau of Indian Affairs documents. And there's about a, I think it's a four or 500 page legal document, um, because again, these are treaties and these are legal documents. And when the uh, Nottawa CP Huron Band of the Potawatomi were trying to get federal recognition, they had to bring a legal case claiming why they had federal recognition. And there's a 500 uh, page legal document that goes into great detail, uh, uh, historic and otherwise, uh, uh, for this claim. And that's an incredible resource. And that's also available freely online. And then the other resource that is I use all the time is the Michigan Pioneer Collection. And those are the first sort of European but mainly American settlers come in. And remember, Europeans are here 100 years before American uh, are here. So those are uh, many of the things we use. And again, we use them all critically and uh, we take what we can. Okay, the long view. Ypsilanti is less than 200 years old. It'll have its bicentennial anniversary here in a couple of, of uh, years. So less than 200 years, that's in a historian terms, we do four generations a century, so that's eight generations. People have been living on the Huron River for 12,000 years. That's about 140 generations. So uh, people have been living, you know, when we're talking about Ypsilanti, his, I mean, Ypsilanti is a blip, is a blip in the time scale in the terms of people living on this river. So I want you to just think of what that means, how many generations that is. How many grandmothers on this river told stories about the past on this river to their grandchildren? Century after century after century. There's no way we're going to excavate all of that long history, but I think it's imperative to understand what happens here and people's connections and the way the land looks to understand that people have been living on this river for 12,000 years, right? 12 thousand years since the end of the very last ice age uh, when you were first able to live on this land when it didn't have a, a mile long ice sheet over it uh, and so as soon as this land is able to be lived on we see um, evidence of people living here now in the rest of the americas that's going to be about twenty thousand. that's the oldest evidence we currently have hard evidence and i there's lots of debates about this is 20 or so thousand years ago. I understand that that some people think it's a lot longer than that. I am not sure, but I know in Michigan, we have very hard Clovis dates for about 12,000 years ago, not far from here. There's a Clovis point found, which is um, was a while ago was considered the first cultural explosion in North America. And now we know that people have been here far longer ago than that. And it will always be longer ago. It will always, it's never going to, we're never going to find out it was earlier, right? It's always going to be longer. This is a Gale point, and I want you to look at how exquisite the craftsmanship, craft personship in this, which is about yay big, right? This is about yay big. And this, that was found uh, up in the Saginaw Valley, and that's about 8,000 years ago. So this is an exquisite craftsmanship, craft personship, 8,000 years old from Michigan. The, here is a, a sort of an archaeological trajectory. And one of the things that the main thing to notice is there's two major archaeological traditions. And this is the way archaeologists have um, compartmentalized. And, and when we compartmentalize, it's always artificial. 
right? But it, it's useful in conceptualizing things. And one of the things you'll notice here, and I think that's important, is we have a large continuity in place, right? So we it's we suppose that the same physical peoples who were here 10,000 years ago are the same people who were here 500 years ago. We, that's what we assume, given the archaeological record. And then a couple of things happen in this period. One, you notice that the archaeological record gets much more concrete and complicated. And the reason of that is because we get pottery about this period, and it's much easier to, um, to stratify pottery right, than it is, to, to, than it is almost anything else. Uh, and so you notice that we get pottery here and it's easy to, it's easier to stratify. So we have more conception of the changes going on. And then the other thing is this happens, this intrusion of the Western Basin. Broadly speaking, the Sandusky tradition, meaning the Sandusky River off of the Lake Erie is an Iroquoian tradition. And broadly speaking, the Western Basin tradition is an Algonquin tradition. So one is matrilineal, one is patrilineal. Generally, by the time we're talking about Iroquoians, we'll live in very large villages, highly agricultural. Uh, Anishinaabe and, and Algonquin people will be agricultural, but a little less so. But the majority of their diet will not yet come from agriculture. And so what you so I think this is really important to recognize. We have a a uh, geological and cultural zone here in which we have two very distinct cultures and one is coming into the other. And we're not you know it's just as easy to imagine that instead of an intrusion of people what you're seeing is married women from the Sandusky tradition coming with their pottery to this tradition. So not an intrusion at all, but a coming together of two traditions. We haven't sussed all of that out yet at all, but I think it's important to recognize that these people that we're talking about here are not the ancestors of the Potawatomi people. The Potawatomi people's ancestors around this time that we're looking at here would have lived east maybe on the St. Lawrence River, and then come to uh, Northern Michigan and the, the Northern Great Lakes in this period, right around here. The people that are living here are closely associated with Potawatomi, they're Algonquin. They're probably a middle Algonquin speaking people and probably their descendants are people like the Fox, the Sauk, which is what Saginaw Bay is named for, Sauk people. Muscatoon, who live all the way in Kickapoo, some of them live all the way in Mexico today. So a central Algonquin people, and maybe some Iroquoian villagers along the Detroit River, right? And we also know that there's a bit of conflict between Algonquin people and Iroquoian people, and sometimes much more than a bit of conflict. So I think that's important to recognize is that there is, there is something very distinct happening well before European arrival that changes things here. Uh, and it's not just agriculture, it's not just the arrival of the bow and arrow, it's not just technological changes, it's, an, it's a cultural shift of some sort, right? And so uh, we will have, by this later period, we're gonna have evidence of either Iroquoian people or Iroquoian influenced people right alongside Algonquin people. Okay, so these watersheds, when I first started looking at this, the only way to understand this landscape from the perspective before the United States is through watersheds. And watersheds are really interesting because watersheds provide a couple of different things. Watersheds, generally, not all watersheds, but a larger watershed will have different elements to it. Uh, uh, it will have its bottom lands near where it empties out. It will have its highlands near where it gathers its creeks. It will have falling areas, right? It, it generally will have several different ecological zones within the watershed. The watershed is also, because of that, if you live on a watershed, you can access all of those different zones of the watershed. And again, we need variation to live on this landscape 
You need the marshes at the head of the river, just like you need the highlands and, and the uplands, right? For American settlers, they needed everything flat to grow corn on. That's the native people needed a variety to be able to live the way they lived in this landscape. So they needed to access the variety that a watershed had to offer. The other thing, of course, is transportation. Uh, the main way, again, horses are brought by, modern horses are brought by the Spanish. Uh, what we think of as horse culture, Native American horse culture is a, is a post-colonial culture. There are no horses here. Uh, people mainly get around in Southern Michigan because we don't have beach this far south. Uh, uh, in dugout canoes along the rivers, and then uh, by walking. And in fact, the northern Ojibwa people and Anishinaabe people will often call the southern people the walkers, right? Because they walk everywhere. And up north, you have access to birch bark, which can create what I regard as one of the greatest tools human beings have ever created anywhere on this planet in all of our history, the birch bark canoe, uh, which allows you to jump watershed. And if you can jump a watershed because you can carry that birch bark canoe with you, and unlike a, uh, a dugout canoe with a birch bark canoe with its tapered ends, you can go up and downstream. With a, with a, with a dugout canoe, you're going to have to push yourself, not paddle yourself, you know, pull yourself upstream and then go downstream. And it's also much harder to portage, right? So, so a watershed is a link to the outside world as well as its own self contained world many of the times. So what we often see is those watersheds are also political divisions between native people. So the Potawatomi villagers on the Huron River, that watershed is their political, their use claim. And you can only claim land because you use it. If you don't use it, you don't have a claim on it. It's like a water fountain. I use a water fountain. When, I, when I'm done using the water fountain, I have no claim on your use of the water fountain, right? Uh, and so that once you're once you're not using the land, you don't have a claim on the land. You can't sell land you used to live on or your dad owned or whatever. That's just not the way this world works. But these watersheds do become sort of political, territorial places you live on the landscape. And one of the things you notice here about where we live, we live right there. Look where we live. We live in the jump between three of the Great Lakes watersheds. So just north of us, you go a little bit. North of us, you will be on the Saginaw River watershed, which will go into Lake Huron. Just west of us, where Stockbridge is, you can get the Thorn Apple um, River, which will go into the Grand River, and you have access to Lake Michigan. So this area right here, settling here means you have access there, there, and there. This is a really good place to settle. And if anybody knows the geography of this area, how many portage lakes? are there just west of Ann Arbor and Dexter. There's a dozen portage lakes there. And that's where you would jump right around Stockbridge, where you would jump the watershed between Lake Erie and basically the Eastern Great Lakes and Lake Michigan and the Western Great Lakes. So that was a hugely important place in the landscape. And you can imagine that was an important place for a long, long time, right? Not just important in the last little bit, and then one of the other things to notice is how do you get then out of the Great Lakes landscape uh, watersheds and then onto the Mississippi and Ohio River water watersheds? And the reason Chicago is the most important city in the Great Lakes is because you can jump. It's the closest jump by the Chicago River between the, the watershed of uh, the Mississippi River watershed and Lake Michigan and the entire Great Lakes watershed. So that little jump, that little access, that little canoe trail allows you to travel from this entire basin to the entire eastern seaboard going all the way down to um, uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And we will find in the mounds and burials along the Huron River uh, uh, marine shells from the Gulf of Mexico, right? And, and people are traveling long distances in this landscape, but people are connected. Uh, uh, over great distances in this landscape. There is mica in this area from, uh, uh, from Georgia. There's copper from the Upper Peninsula. And there is obsidian from large amounts of obsidian. It wasn't just brought once from, um, from uh, Wyoming. And we know exactly the rock base in Wyoming that this obsidian was harvested on. So people have connections over this, a large area, a large area. Uh, so one of the things here, and here's our Huron River 
watershed. And one of the things you notice is where is Ypsilanti in that? It is where the headwaters and the low waters sort of come together, right? And all of the, there's not a town down there. There's not a town down here. There's towns here, here, and here, right? And that's exactly where the Native American villages were. The other thing that's important geographically about this area is what is drained now, but that's the Black Swamp. And that would have been south kind of where Toledo was. And that actually was a barrier, uh, 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 a pretty formidable barrier between the cultures north of that and south of that. I mean, you would have to go all the way around the Great Lakes basically to get there. And so you see quite a difference, cultural variation, south of the Black Swamp north of the Black Swamp. Uh, and that Black Swamp also helped protect Detroit uh, and Native American communities here from repeated uh, American invasions. So that was also an important uh, uh, um, geographic uh, place to defend. Okay, I'm gonna have to speed up because we're going through it. So here is a 1915 Hinsdale Archaeological Atlas of Southeast Michigan. And you can read all of these online. Uh, Hinsdale is one of those grave robbers, right? Uh, and he writes a great deal about, and most of it is wrong, but it's full of very interesting information. He writes a great deal about this area. Now look at this map. So it's what it's showing you is all different kinds of things. It's showing you native village sites. It's showing you burial sites. It's showing you where mounds are. It's showing you very concretely where trails are. And if you were to look at this, you would think all of this is happening at the same time. But of course, this mound, is a thousand years older than that village site. And this trail was not used 10,000 years ago, but this one was. And you see the, the point. What this, what this does is flatten out time as well as flattening out space, right? So you have to take this with a grain of salt. This isn't what the native landscape looked like. This is a flattening out of that landscape. And only certain things in that landscape are referenced here. Where are the maple groves? Where, where, you know, where are the fishing areas? Where are all of these other places in the landscape that native people would have used? But what I do want you to notice is the trails because these trails follow most of our roads. So here's Huron River Drive, here's Michigan Avenue, here's Pontiac Trail, here's Plymouth Ann Arbor Road. Many of the roads you take every day, every single day are trails, native trails used over a great period of time. As, as everybody here, I hope, knows, when a trail is not used, how long does it take for that trail to grow over? A year, two years, three years, and then it becomes almost impossible to find that trail unless it was an extremely heavily used trail. So one of the things, if a trail is obvious in 1915, boy, has that trail been used, right? That's, that trail was used very recently, right? or was used for a very long time, until very recently. And so I think these trails give you a sense. And one of the things you notice about the trails, they do two things. They follow watersheds and they jump watersheds, right? They follow watersheds and they jump watersheds. So Huron River Drive follows the watershed. Michigan Avenue, which is the old sock trail that would have gone all the way to Chicago, uh, it jumps all of those watersheds and it jumps them at the shortest point because you're using the landscape. You're not an idiot, right? So between, you know, one of the things I always think of and where they jump, you often see a village. So here's where, where the Michigan Avenue jumps across the Huron River, Native American village, where it hits Saline, Native American village, where it goes down uh, to the Jackson River, Native American village, you get my point, right? So the landscape, you can see the landscape through a Native American lens by knowing what the landscape's nature is, by what it is. The other thing, let's go here. So all maps deserve a critical look. So here's a much more detailed of Washtenaw County. And what I love about this, what do you know, what is so obvious about this? The Native American landscape, where the lines are not straight, right? Because they're, they're negotiating a natural environment. And the American landscape are all of these squares. They're imposing on the natural environment an unnatural landscape to divide up and sell as parcels of land. That's why we have those squares there. 
That's what the Northwest Territory will act gave us a divided landscape. This landscape with these divisions would be impossible for a Native American to, to live on. You live in this area here. This is where your village is. You go up here to hunt. You go down here to fish. You go up here for your maple, right? You know, these are rooms of your house. Just like our houses, we use rooms for different things. We cook in the kitchen. We sleep in the bedroom. And sometimes we close those rooms off in different seasons. You don't go at all to work in your garage during winter, or that's where you do go during winter because you have a heater in there, but you don't go on your porch. This landscape are those different rooms of your house, right? And if you start putting up these divisions, you can't get to your house. So what allowed Americans to live here, a, a landscape in which you would farm and then sell your produce into the market, would mean that native people couldn't live here by the simple geography of how you placed it on the map. And so what you get is an incompatibility, an absolute incompatibility of two lifestyles. And the fence is the greatest uh, uh, example of that incompatibility. For an American, you had to have a fence to keep your animals in and to keep the animals out of your crops. For a Native American, a fence denied you access to the landscape you lived on. So something has to give. And that's why what happened on this land became a genocidal contest. That's what happened here. And so here we see Hinsdale opening a mound and full of racist ideas about this Native American person. And the mound he is opening, and you can see from what he describes here, uh, many of the items that we're talking about from that large uh, interactive sphere people are living on, that is right here, and it's where 23 crosses the Huron River, you know, where Co Concordia College is, and you look crossing north along 23, and you'll see a copse of woods, uh, and that's where these three mounds are, right there, uh, and they're probably completely worn down over time, but, but I am 100% sure that elements there remain. Uh, so, you know, that landscape, people lived and died. Now, the people buried in those mounds would have been a mystery to the Potawatomi people. They would have respected them. They would, might have even placed their cemeteries adjacent to them as a way to honor ancestors and a way to connect with the spirituality of the place. But the Potawatomi people would not, they would have been different ancestors. They would have not been different ancestors. So often I am asked to do um, to do uh, uh, land acknowledgments. And that's very hard to do in most of Michigan and most of the United States. Why is it hard to do? Because people don't live on the land the same way we do. And we are trying to force them into living on the land in the way we do, where you live here, it's yours, you've always, that's not the way people lived on the land in Michigan. So often when we do land acknowledgments, we're again, falsifying, not just, you know, because we're talking about a time and a place, right? We, it's impossible to do all the land acknowledgements for the people who have lived here for the last 12,000 years. I think what we ought to do inst instead of an acknowledgement, I think what in some ways would be more valuable of an exercise is acknowledge who profited from taking of this land, because those people still profit. Those people still have the money. And then that raises and still have the power and their families do. And then that raises a reciprocity and a reparations, right? If we acknowledge who profited off of the genocide of this area and we acknowledge the companies and the families and the wealthy people, then perhaps we can get some restitution. But if we're making a false acknowledgement or a, uh, a simplistic, rather, let's say that a simplistic acknowledgement about who was here, it's, and then washing our hands of it. I mean, if I acknowledge I stole your TV and I don't give it back to you, I'm not sure that's any progress at all. In fact, it might be worse, right? So I want to get us to a point where, uh, where we can, we, we're not repeating the same mistakes. We're not repeating the same mistakes. This is again, a cultural and ecological frontier. We don't have a whole lot of time to go into this, but I really like this map here on the right uh, because it's much more honest about the, the way people live in the landscape. We've often seen 
uh, images of the native landscape and you'll you'll see the little squares and here's the Potawatomi and right there and they're all butted up next to each other and there's a territorial boundary between the two and that's not the way it worked uh, because there was an understanding that people needed to move in the landscape to be able to to take advantage of all that the landscape had to offer right so you had to negotiate empty spaces and you had to ensure that there were empty spaces Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to move around in the landscape. If you were always butting up against each other, it would be impossible to work the system of management that people had created in the Great Lakes. So what you see, this is much more true. You have the Wendat, then over here, the Tiantante, maybe we'll, we'll call them the Petun. Down here, you have what we'll call the Neutral. Down here, the Erie, and here are the, the um, Six Nations or the seven later the Seven Nations, Seneca, and they're not even all together, right? They're very distinct areas with a separation between them. And I think that's really to understand how people negotiated the Great Lakes and uh, their own interactions with other people. This is the map that you want to think about. That that this area also means that as systems change and relationships change, this configuration can change. Right, but if people are all bumped up against each other, the only way to change that configuration is violence and war, right? Uh, or, or intense negotiations and a kind of formal ownership of the landscape that's just not uh, a part of even the imagination of people here. The other thing to understand about this map is uh, the people that we think of as a singular people, Odawa, Ojibwa, uh, they are tribal peoples who come together and disperse and come together and disperse as different bodies. And there are many different groups who are now subsumed under the name Ojibwa, for example. Odawa and Potawatomi have a different history than the Ojibwa. Potawatomi are further um, developed further south, maybe around Ludington. There's a lot of sock words in Potawatomi. Uh, Potawatomi are generally thought to have developed a much uh, have have relied more heavily on agriculture. Odawa re relied, as their name s says, much more heavily on trade. Ojibwa much more heavily on, on hunting and, and things like that, but also trading items that they hunted. And so one, even thinking about Ojibwa people, there would not have, nobody would have said there's a single Ojibwa group of people even a hundred years ago. That is a, again, it's a way to understand a larger cultural group with a common language, a common past, those families that we meet at our homecomings, right? It's a way of understanding that, but it's not necessarily the way that Nipissing would have understood themselves, right? But it's useful in many ways. And there is lots of things that are common and keeps people together. It's clan systems, all of that. Okay, rich evidence of exchange and systematic relationships between vastly different cultural groups. I hope you're getting the picture, right? Okay, now we're going to get into some uh, uh, hard history and then we're going to move quickly a little bit through it. So one of the issues uh, is that I, uh, you know, every teacher when we're, when we're doing sort of history in the past that comes to me asks me who was here first. Right. And first is always the question, what do you mean first? You know, like who was the, uh, I don't know if we can ever answer that question. We can answer who was here 1760. We can answer that. And there is, there is a bit of a, a mystery and a problem specific to the Great Lakes, which is that much of the Great Lakes, this area of Michigan and then the Ohio River Valley, was depopulated in the mid 17th century because of a series of wars brought on by an accentuated beaver trade with the English and some guns coming in. And it meant that the much greater beavers for trading were up here, but the people getting the guns were out here, so they didn't have access to the good trade. So they're not fighting for land or to con a conquest of land, but to control the beaver trade so they can continue to have access to weapons, which gives you an advantage over your neighbors, which is an also another way of saying that you know, the idea that there's a common Native American identity, well, any more than there's a common European identity, I suppose there is, but it didn't prevent them from killing each other in mass numbers several times in the last hundred years, right? So, you know, what is your identity? And we, the, an, an, an Indian identity, a Native identity, an indigenous pan identity, what does it mean to be Indian? will only develop 
in the context of people treating you as something separate, right? You're not, you don't view yourself that way. You're separate from Algonquin, you're separate from the people, but are you all Indians? Once you're treated as all Indians, you might begin to see yourselves that way. And that's what happens in this process. Um, but this area is largely depopulated, both from out and out war, but also from the rumor of war, and then of course, disease. And uh, that disease will have started in the in this area here. And it wasn't, I think it's important to remember that what brings disease is not necessarily a white body, but what brings disease to North America is the bringing of a European lifestyle. That's really what brings disease to the, so your pigs, right? Your, your domestic, you're living with animals, all different kinds of animals in the same house, right? It was, Native people thought it was rather disgusting to live with a, uh, pigs and cows, but you, but Europeans did that. And there was constant, you know, just the way we've seen with the uh, COVID and other, that's our, our modern diseases jump from animals to humans because of close contact, domestication of animals, and then living with those animals means that, that that's where disease comes from. So when the Jesuits came, yes, there was some disease. When the Jesuits brought their pigs, that's really when the disease really started. And one of the things we know, the Jesuits actually took uh, of the Wendat villages. Now, the Wendat are a confederacy of six, later seven different tribes. Within those tribes are lots of different villages, clans, clan segments, all having their own role to play. Uh, but this group of people lived in an area about the size of Washtenaw County, uh, in Simcoe, uh, in, uh, in, in Ontario, uh, and uh, a census in the 1630s, about 35,000 people lived there. So even though you don't have 35,000 people living all over the land, you know, from county to county to county, you have areas of extremely dense populations. And those villages would certainly have been as large as anything that a European at the same time would have come from. In fact, many of them would have been much larger. A native, uh, Iroquoian longhouse in 1000 AD would have been much bigger than anything any European or English person, Anglo-Saxon was living in at the time. It would have been much more grand. Um, you know, how many villages in England in 1350 have over 2000 people in them? Maybe five or six. How many villages in the, in, along the, uh, uh, the rivers here had had those size villages dozens and dozens but they're they're not spread all over the landscape but we know that in a period of about 20 years about 80 percent of that population died and it wasn't all at once it comes you know uh it comes in waves right and uh and often that wave will hit young people or old people. And you can imagine when all of the old people die in your community, that is more than just losing members of your community, that's losing knowledge, that's losing resources, that's losing connection to the past. When all of your young people die, right, in a single winter, or 90% of them die in a single winter, that will challenge the existing stru structures of your society. If 90% of Ypsilanti died tomorrow, would we be able to continue with the fire department and the schools and the mayor? You know, we would have to create new systems, right? They might look a lot like the old systems, but of necessity, we're gonna have to create new systems. Now, Ojibwa people and people who are living a little more spread out, the disease doesn't go through them as quickly and as fast. But it's also important to remember that these diseases will hit these communities over and it didn't just end in the first wave of diseases. All the way up until the 1840s and 50s in Michigan, these communities will be getting waves and waves of European diseases. So a constant ratcheting down of numbers through diseases. And sometimes whole villages gone, gone in a single season, right? So we're getting a, a cataclysmic event in certain villages, right? And then we're getting a shift in culture and power and, and where people are living. So what happens is most of the people from this area will, will end up in sort of Green Bay and the Keweenaw and coming over here to get out of the way of the wars and the diseases and the conflict that has started because of 
basically because of the European arrival into this territory in great numbers, at least into this area. So we don't know who was here because when this area is repopulated, it is repopulated from the exiled communities that have reconstituted themselves up, up here. And those will be villages that include Odawa, Ojibwa, and even Wyandotte people, and Petun people, and Sauk people, and Fox people, and all of these different people. So what we see is a lot, the Potawatomi start taking on, you know, uh, taking on characteristics of living like uh, uh, Wyandotte people. We see longhouses being built where originally we would not have longhouses. So you, there's a cultural, uh, a, not a, uh, you know, there's, People are taking culture from not white people, but from other Europe, other Native Americans in this area and creating a kind of a Great Lakes culture, a Great Lakes culture with all kinds of pasts in different places. And that doesn't mean that there's not continuity going all the way through. Maybe me and Ami up here are very continuous, but it means it's a combination of continuity and change, just like all cultures at all times. Okay, and we're gonna continue the beaver trade, why was beaver so important? And it's for hats, it's for hats. Uh, that is, the, it's for European, it's a style. It's mainly for hats. They make, if you've seen a beaver, they're watertight, they're heavy, they're warm, it's perfect for a hat. And the Europeans at the time were engaged in the Hundred Years War. And so they had lots of armies in need of hats. And the Northern area of, of, the, of the Great Lakes has much better beaver right? Much thicker fur, bigger beaver, etc. So these areas quickly became exhausted of beaver, and then you wanted to get access to the beaver up there. So what were you trading for? Guns was just the smallest part of it. Uh, you were trading for many different things, but mainly metalware and mainly axes uh, and, and those kinds of things. And if you've ever used a metal axe and a stone axe, you know the reason why, right? I mean, a metal axe lasts last longer, et cetera, et cetera but native people don't have access to making metal. And the French people, even though we have stories of them being trappers and all of that, they don't have access to the great beaver areas. So they, they need each other. Which brings me to the Europeans. There are different groups of Europeans with very different, you know, when we talk about Europeans coming here, just like with native people, we have to be specific. A French fur trader has a very different view of the Great Lakes than a French Jesuit who has a very different view of the Great Lakes than a French general, who has a very different view of the Great Lakes than an American farmer, who has a very, you get my point, right? So broadly speaking, and this is the vastly oversimplified version of this, the French people wanted to trade, the English wanted an empire, and the Americans wanted your land, right? So that, you know, I, again, vastly oversimplified. But you could negotiate with the French over trade. You might even be able to negotiate with the English over their empire, but the Americans in the land, there wasn't a lot of negotiation there, right? So again, when we're saying Europeans came here, again, the French only were able to live in Detroit because of native people. They are completely and utterly dependent on native people for, for living here. And without native people, there would be no reason to live here, right? For the Americans, there's no reason to live here with native people here. So they're very different ways of looking at this. That doesn't mean the French were less colonialists. I mean, they had a different kind of colonialism, right? Okay, let's, let's go quickly to the founding of Detroit. Detroit is founded in 1701, and it's founded by native people. I know it has a French name, but those people who gathered up in Green Bay and those areas, those exile communities, the French have been able to negotiate a broad peace between all of these warring groups. And now the Detroit River area, which was extremely hostile and dangerous, has become uh, uh, you know, a place you can access again because the wars and the conflict is over. And the Detroit River is that, that choke point that unites the Southern Great Lakes with the Northern Great Lakes. So I, I'm sure that for a long period of time before the Beaver Wars, that area was an extremely important place. And, and when the French and the native people decide where's the first place we're gonna go when we repopulate this area to take advantage of all the things that have to offer, Detroit is the first place they're going to go. And we're talking about 100 or 200 French people and several thousand native people from a variety of different groups. So who founded Detroit? French people or native people? Modern Detroit is founded by native people for a native agenda, for a native agenda. The French are part of that native agenda. So often when we think of, 
agency. Uh, what we're saying is Native people are reacting to Europeans and giving Native people agency to be able to react to Europeans. Well, Europeans are reacting to what Native people are doing. You know, agency is also that, that Europeans are playing catch up and having to, Native people have their own agenda here. And so Europeans are reacting to the agency of Native people all of the time. And one of those is the founding of Detroit. The first reference we have, written reference by a European to Detroit, is the Jesuits knocking down the stone idols on uh, on uh, what we now call Belle Isle or what was called Hog Island back then. The other thing about this is there's a conflict as those Native people come back to Detroit over whose ancestors were here first. And we think there were a series of wars conflicts called the Fox Wars that happened in the immediate aftermath of the, the repopulating of this area. And we think that's probably because the Fox, the Sock, the people connected with that had a claim to this land uh, uh, because they were the ones who were here immediately before having to remove and try to stake that claim uh, and then got into a conflict with uh, the people who had uh, um, arrived with a new claim on land that wasn't being used at that moment. And, and so we think that that's what's happening there. So that may be a very good clue about who was here before. The other thing I want you to see is that the native villages move. First Wyandotte, second Wyandotte. Ypsilanti is always where Ypsilanti is. But where is this village? This village is not a geographical space. It is the people who make up that village. And wherever those people go, that village goes. That's where the village is. So a village, a community, a, a formal community moves in the landscape. Again, that's why doing things like land acknowledgments is so difficult. The landscape is moved around on and it's all being used at different times. Um, a village, you think about it, you know, the trash piles up, the, the firewood gets cut down, the, the soil gets depleted of its energies and you're gonna have to move up river to the old and and you know the 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 wood your longhouses are start, starting to rot so you're going to move up river to that great old site that you used to live on 20 years ago and take advantage of that area as nature cleans up and takes over the old village area and then in another generation you'll come back which one is your village they all are they all are this is really interesting this is what the village of the potawatomies looks like in detroit at the time and one of the things you notice is people are living in longhouses. They're not living in what we would consider a traditional Anishinaab. They, they've, they've assimilated, they've culturally assimilated the Iroquoian way of living. And each one of these dots is a hearth. And each hearth would be home to two families on either side. And each one of these is, let's say, about 15 feet long. So 15, 30, that's one of those is about 60 feet long, a longhouse with let's say five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, about 40 people living in it. So this village is pretty good sized village, is pretty good sized village. And my guess is you can see that it's formally laid out and these are probably different clans and maybe even different ethnic groups, right? The people who married the Ojibwa live over here and the people over here. Okay, um, I think we're gonna have to stop there because we've gone too far uh, tonight to continue uh, and keep our time. Uh, so we're a little bit behind schedule, but I really wanted to do that uh, long-term discussion uh, to be able to get to the really concrete history of the Americans, the wars of conquest, the wars of resistance, the confederacies, and then the very concrete history of um, Okia and Maguago's village uh, that were here uh, when Tecumseh arrived on this land in uh, uh, to fight the Americans and actually take Detroit uh, in 1814. So I think that we'll leave it there uh, and know that uh, we'll spend a little bit more time next week uh, to go through uh, uh, um, uh, the history. Uh, so maybe we'll take two hours next week, leaving time for uh, uh, discussion 